so this is joint work with George Bicius, who's also at UMass Amherst. Uh, and this talk has really been motivated by a lot of the challenges that have been discussed in talks that have happened earlier at this conference. So just to take a subset of some of the long-term engineering challenges that have been brought up, uh, these include that, that motivate Bobtail. This includes an accurate difficulty adjustment, right? Because if we can't adjust difficulty correctly all the time, there's going to be this uneven spacing of blocks. And uneven spacing of blocks is going to hinder adoption in the sense of it's going to give this, I don't know, sheen of unreliability to the Bitcoin Cash Network. So we've also heard talks on zero, uh, zero confirmation or, you know, certainly related to that is a low delay in confirmation. And low delays can happen because you're waiting too long for the next block to come. Or maybe you're waiting for a lot of blocks to come. You're waiting for six blocks to come before you're really sure about this, this confirmation being um, valid. And that all relates to the double spend attack. So in general, we also really just want a reliable, smooth transaction throughput. And a lot of the talks have here have been about increasing the size of the blocks, right? And even if you got to a terabyte block, that wouldn't help you with the interblock time, right? If you suddenly have to wait 30 minutes for the next block to come, who cares that it's a terabyte? You're still waiting for that, that block to arrive. Okay, and so all of this, although it hasn't been talked much um, at, the, at the conference yet, this is all also related, it turns out, to resilience against denial of service attacks. And by that, I really only mean selfish mining and eclipse attacks. Okay, and so the thing is that even if conditions are perfect, and perhaps even optimistically so, that maybe the mining power isn't changing at all, it's still the case that about seven times a day there's going to be, say, 30 minutes or more between blocks. That's the ideal of no, nothing's even under attack, and these six block wait times are standard. So this is all related to what I'm going to talk to you about today. The other motivation for talking about Bobtail, which I haven't even described yet, is some of the medium-term planning that's been going on in um, Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin ABC and others. So for example, it's not the use of Bobtail, but rather just the evaluation of Bobtail um, is under consideration by Bitcoin Unlimited to reduce interblock time variance, increase double spend resistance, improve um, DDA, and achieve better mining. So similarly, again, not Bobtail, but Bitcoin ABC has talked about improving difficulty adjustment. And so Bobtail itself is not a difficulty adjustment algorithm, but it improves the performance of any difficulty adjustment algorithm because if block interblock time variance is low, if there's an even spacing between blocks, difficulty adjustment are, is easy, right? Okay, so actually I also just want to go back and take a moment to say um, uh, I'm also part of the set of co-authors that are involved in graphene. And just to tell you, we have a pull request out for graphene. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but it's um, a, a complete working version. It has a unit and end-to-end -end test that pass graphene blocks between locally running instances. Um, what remains to be done in, in our pull request is, really it's George's pull request, is performance tuning and test net deployment. But we're getting there, so I'll talk about that maybe at the next conference. Okay. So in this talk, I'm going to remind you of how Bobtail operates, or maybe even introduce it to you if you've never been, if you've never seen it before. I'm going to quantify some of its improvements to Bitcoin Cash, and theoretically, and then I'm going to tell you about new developments that we've been that we've had with Bobtail, and tell you some of the next steps that we have planned. So, um, why is there variance between blocks in Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, anything that does proof of work mining? That's it's it's because of proof of work mining. So. All of the miners, what they're all doing is taking a header, putting a nonce in there, and then taking the hash of it. And that hash is really sampling a number at random between 0 and 2 to the 256 minus 1. And so we all know, right, that the first miner to get lucky and find a sample below the target value wins. So here's some samples. Nothing's really working out until A is the one that gets lucky, and they win the block. So sometimes a miner will get lucky, and that's when the blocks come early. And sometimes everyone collectively is unlucky, and that's when the blocks come late. Okay, and so this is a statistical phenomenon. This is the distribution of how often blocks come. And you can see at the bottom, I have the scale for Bitcoin. It's literally the same distribution for Ethereum. You just have to rewrite the scale at the top. It's like Celsius and Fahrenheit. So 30, or yeah, 5% of the time, it's at least 30 minutes between blocks. And there's sort of like a middle waste, right? Between 80% of the time, it's between one and 23 minutes. So one thing I want you to take away from this talk, as I sort of alluded to before, is that 
the size of the block is kind of analogous to network bandwidth, right? If you want to get more throughput between Tokyo and San Francisco, then lay down more fiber. If you want to get more transactions, then make the block size bigger. But that doesn't change the speed of light, the fiber, right? You still have a propagation delay. And so the analogy isn't quite perfect because I'm really talking about the variance in delay or delay jitter, sometimes it's called. But that's the parameter that I want to talk about in this talk. It's, it's not making the blocks bigger. It's not going to fix the delay or the delay variance. It's adjusting a different parameter in Bitcoin. So I'm not going to go into it in this talk, but if you look at a talk online from Bitcoin Scaling, I explain why high variance is actually the cause of, or at least an exacerbator, of double spend and selfish mining attacks, okay? So how do you reduce this interblock variance? So in Bobtail, this is what we do. If you think about Bitcoin today, I want you to think of it as we take samples, we, we ask the miners for headers whose hash is below a target, and we take the first one and only one. And you can average a single number, right? It's just that number. So what if you were to average instead k samples, and if that average was below a target, that would still be in line with the same sort of proof of work mining behavior. So let's say that k equals four. What we would do is adjust the target slightly because mining is a little bit harder. We want to make the target easier. And then we wait for headers to come in from the, from the miners. Now these aren't blocks, it's almost like a weak block, right? So here we wait until we have at least four. We take their average and we say, oh, we don't have a block yet. The lowest four I've seen aren't below the target. So we wait, the average is getting lower. Finally, we take the lowest four. There's a collection of miners here who have contributed to this now full block, and you actually distribute rewards proportionally to the proofs. We call them proofs, these little sub-block headers. Um, you get a reward proportional to the number of proofs that you have included in the new block. The miner with the lowest, the header that hashes to the lowest value, is the one that produces the block, and what they get to do is decide which transactions go in it. Okay? So... It turns out that if you do some math, you can figure out the formula for adjusting the target as uh, once you decide on the value of k. k is the number of proofs that you average together to form a block. And the formula is not so important. I'm putting it up there just to show you that you could actually do this switch in a single block. Like it could just be a sort of a hard fork where you, you make this change. And so this is in a lot of ways basic applied statistics, right? The, the difficulty setting is not formally an estimator, but just think of it that way. If I told you that there's a bus that loops around part of Tokyo in a circle, and I want you to tell me how often it goes around the circle, well, you can't do that easily from one observation of how long it took. But if I let you view it four or five or 10, maybe even 40 times, you'd have a very good estimate of the average time for that bus to go around. And when you create a block with a single, proof of, with a single hash value as proof of work, that single value is not great information for estimating how much work has been done. It's pretty good information, as you can tell, we're all using Bitcoin. But if you included more values in estimating the amount of work, then your estimates would be better and the variance is lower. Okay, and so it turns out if you do some more math, the variance of this new um, method is one over K. So in other words, if you take two values, the variance is half of what it is. If you take 40 values, the variance in interblock times is 1 40th of what it is now, okay? So, what the, so there's different values of k you can choose from. Here you can see my original k equals one line that I put up earlier. If you chose k equals 40, then in the worst case, the worst 40% of blocks would come out uh, 13 to 18 minutes after the previous block. And so actually we're still keeping the average at 10 blocks here. Now the waste, the middle 80%, come out every seven to 12 minutes. So the average would be 10 minutes, but the interblock time would be between seven and 12 minutes 80% of the time. Okay, so the interesting thing is this isn't just a convenience, right? Wouldn't it be great to have a blockchain where blocks come out very regularly, very dependable, dependably? But it actually thwarts all the, a, a lot of different attacks and hardens the blockchain. So right now we all wait six confirmations for something to go through because we're worried about this double spend attack. Well, what if I told you you had an attacker with 40% of the mining power and I could just give you a one block confirmation? You'd say, that's crazy. And the reason is this graph, it shows that a miner with 40% of the mining power could succeed at double spending 53% of the time. Those aren't very good odds, right? If you did bobtail, this averaging of 40 block, 40 block headers before you released a block, then the chances of that same attacker succeeding with double spend drop to below 1%. 
So this is a significant improvement. If this was adopted in Bitcoin Cash, it would be the most secure blockchain algorithm out there by far. Okay. So similarly, oh sorry, that was the circle I didn't put up. Similarly, this approach really completely mitigates selfish mining. This is the probability of selfish, or rather the proportion of blocks that a selfish miner gets in Bitcoin now. It's that red line right on top. And so I'm, if you're familiar with the paper, I'm setting gamma equal to one. In other words, the miner has a huge advantage here. So any amount of mining power um, leads to successful selfish mining in Bitcoin now. But if you set K equal to say 20 or 40 or anything really above 20, the chances, uh, or rather the, the proportion of blocks that the selfish miner gets in Bobtail is always below honest unless they have 40% of the mining power, 49% of the mining power, which really just more than decimates the selfish mining attack. Okay, so <clears throat> this is some stuff that I presented previously. What have we been doing in the meantime? Well, we've really been focusing on, I should say, I meant to say at the top that this is a paper that we've not submitted for peer review yet. We're about to do that, but this is sort of just work in progress right now. But in the meantime, we've been investigating attacks, new attacks that Bobtail suddenly allows for by its use. And so th there's no attack we come up with yet that we haven't been able to solve. The most interesting one, and the hardest one for us to solve, has been withholding attacks. And it's sort of, one way to think of it is sort of an intra-block selfish mining attack. Like we're all mining, but I'm keeping my proofs to myself, and I'm not allowing you to use those. So we had a sort of complicated reward scheme, and we found that a simpler one, well, it's not only simpler, because simpler's better, but it actually eliminates the threat of this attack. And so to remind you, the miners are gonna announce block headers, but not necessarily the transactions that go with it. We're calling those proofs. And then a collection of proofs together will form a block if the average of the hash of those proofs is below the target. And then we're gonna include this requirement that proofs reference the smallest other proof they've seen to date. What do I mean by reference? Well, every block references its prior, right? It includes the hash of the prior in its header. So we add this requirement that you add the hash of the lowest proof that you've seen. So um, the consequence of this is it ends up thwarting these attacks. Um, by the way, the, the reference to the other proof is called a support, okay? So each proof contains a support, and some of the supports will actually reference the lowest proof that was ever created for that block, okay? So in the end, miners are gonna be rewarded for the number of proofs that appear in a block, and then they're gonna get a bonus when their support names the smallest proof in the blocks. And the bonus incentivizes everyone to announce all of their proofs. And let me explain how this works, but one other thing to notice is that sometimes there's more proofs, you have a lot of proofs and there's more than one way to construct a block. Miners, whoever's creating the block with the lowest proof available, they break ties among all the blocks that are available by favoring their own proofs, okay? So we allow that, we encourage it in fact. So one thing you may be asking is like, well, is it still the case in Bobtail that miners get rewards that are proportional to the mining power? And if that's true, then the reward should be linear with the mining power, and that's exactly what we see here. And so as I said, miners get rewarded um, based on the number of proofs that are included in the block, and then they get a bonus reward for referencing the lowest one. Now, the order of these proofs as they come out is random in the sense that um, they don't come out like smaller, smaller, and smaller, and smaller, and smaller, right? So the lowest one will come out on average halfway through. And so if you're being honest, um, about half of your proofs that made it into the block should reference the lowest one. Okay, so that's exactly what we see here in this, Monte Car in this simulation I wrote of, of the whole system. Okay, so things are proportional, which is great. Now the problem is, is that the miners, as I said before, can withhold proofs so that no one else can reference them. And so this is a kind of denial of service attack. It's really selfish mining. And so if you do this, as I see, in, as I show in this, the results of the simulation here, the blue line, which are the honest miners, really lose some bonus rewards that they would have gotten. So that's a big problem. We don't really want to allow for that. In fact, it's a little worse than I just showed in the last one, because in the last one, just to make it clear, the selfish miners, the intra-block selfish miners, weren't even prioritizing their own proofs. But if they do that, it gets even worse. And now they can even, the red line there is the attacker, they can increase the number of proofs they get while hurting the honest miners. So this seems like a disaster, but in fact it's, it's fixable with a simple, a simple change. So to, to, we enhance the protocol in a very small way. We say that miners don't accept blocks mined by someone else when they 
don't include a lowest proof that they know about. That's number one. And the other thing is that miners simply accept new proofs that they hear in a first in, first out sort of way. And I don't mean according to the timestamp in the header, just as they see them locally coming off the network. And what this thwarts is someone withholding and then at the last minute saying, no, 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 I got all these, right, here you go. And so they won't actually, the, the attacker in that sense won't get their proofs or bonuses um, into the system. So basically, if there's like a, a batch of proofs that suddenly come out from an attacker, the honest miners just try to create a block one by one in the order they receive them, prioritizing their own proofs. And that actually not only hurts the attacker, it actually gives the kind of extra money to the, to the honest. So now this whole withholding attack is basically economically disincentivized, right? So basically, honest behavior will get you the most rewards in the bobtail system. Okay. Okay, so what I wanna say is that this is actually a generalization of Satoshi's ideas and not a break from it, right? We're just increasing the number of values that are compared against the target, right? Rather than just saying the single lowest value, we take the mean of several values. And you can think of the block size as being a parameter that can be expanded, or you can think about the number of proofs that get averaged before there's a block as something that can be expanded. As I said, um, the target can be adjusted in one block, so it's not like you, you can just, this is a hard fork, but you can just agree on a particular block where things change over for a particular K. It's compatible with existing ASIC hardware. I didn't show slides on why, but I did present that at, a, uh, at the scaling conference, and what I said is absolutely true. Um, as I said already, the rewards are proportional to mining power, so it doesn't cost, cause any problems there. The real costs are that you have to include extra information in the header, but I'm talking about hundreds of bytes or maybe a, a couple K at the most. Compared to the block size, I mean, this is nothing. I mean, going from eight megabytes to 32 is ridiculous amount more data than what I'm talking about adding to the header. Um, there's actually some extra traffic because you announce proofs as they happen, but um, it's, again, nothing compared to the actual transaction tra traffic in Bitcoin Cash. Certainly the extra transaction traffic that would come from larger blocks. And of course, there's, there's new code to write and testing of that code, that's a cost, but we're, re we're ready to do that, right? I mean, we ourselves are ready to do that. And um, part of the reason we wanted to be the ones to implement Graphene was to show the community that we're ready to contribute. So we'd love to do that for Bobtail as well and work with others to do that. Okay, so conclusions are just um, difficulty adjustment. So these are really almost more consequences than conclusions. So if you have low variance interblock times, if blocks come out easily, then any difficulty algorithm will be more accurate. Additionally, um, as I said already, one block verification is more secure. And then, you know, to link back to the other talks that um, were presented, you could think of these proofs that I'm talking about as actually just weak blocks, right? They're just block headers. They could be the block headers and the transactions that went into that block or not. But if you include the transactions that were mined that the miner's doing before they present their proof, then that is weak blocks. And you could actually see which miners are including which blocks in their, in their forthcoming blocks. And that announcement of which transactions you're doing would actually be very efficiently done with graphene. And then furthermore, all of this information is more information for the, the difficulty adjustment. And another thing is that with these proofs, you could actually estimate the amount of mining power that any, individual mining, that any individual mining pool has at the moment. So you could say, I'm gonna buy this $100, maybe $800 stereo, right? And then you could see what percentage of the mining power is actually working on that particular transaction. Not just from their history, but from the actual proof value. There's ways to convert the hash of a header into an estimation of hash power. Okay. And finally, as I said, it protects against uh, selfish mining attacks, eclipse attacks. We've shown that small tweaks to the scheme prevent against what I'll call intra-mining, intra-block selfish mining or intra-block withholding attacks. And the end result is that transaction throughput is even and reliably on time, which has great user adoption benefits, right? People would see it as a very uh, even-handed, very nice, reliable currency. So. That's about it, I'll take any questions you have. My contact information is there. There is a PDF of um, Bobtail on archive. We've, the work I just presented here is not included, but soon we'll update that um, to make sure it's part of the PDF. So I'll take any questions, thanks. Thank you, Brian, all right. Okay, questions, you gotta forgive me because I'm the runner guy, so. All right, go from here. Hey, 
Thanks, Ryan. Uh, one quick question. You talk about rewards for these proofs. Can you just talk more about it? Where, where is this going to come from and how, you know, any drawbacks and every, everything like that? So George has this great quote um, that I love to quote, and he says that um, all blockchains are just orchestrated incentives, right? I mean, that's why they work. You want, and someone else said it a different way, that you want all, all honest behavior to be just naturally incentivized. And so to us, um, the structure of the rewards is what makes the protocol secure. So um, I mean, that's where it really comes from. Um, I'm not sure that's what you're asking, but. Yeah, like Yeah, so for instance, um, if like right now the Coinbase of course is 12.5, right? And in this, in this slide right here, I'm, just, I'm saying there's 40 proofs that together, the hash of those proofs are averaged together to see if they're below the target. So if you're a miner with 20% of the mining power, you'll get on average eight of the 40 proofs. So you will get eight fortieths of the reward, right? Now additionally, it's a little more complicated. You would get eight fortieths plus you would get uh, four four fortieths on the bonus side, so you would get, there's, anyway, the formula is basically the number of proofs you have plus the number of bonuses. If you're following this, sorry if that's confusing, one consequence is actually that um, the Coinbase would actually be a little bit variable per block with Bobtail, right? You wouldn't necessarily give out 12.5 um, because the number of bonuses can change per block. So I don't think this is a bad thing, like you could take the extra and put it in a pool and there's other um, nice consequences, other protocols that are um, available because there would be a pool of unspent Coinbase. Um, it would help with other problems that I've heard. So it's, it's a detail I didn't really have time to go into. But you, the short answer to your question is you get a reward based on the number of proofs you have and the number of blocks, number of proofs that you, the number of proofs you have that reference the lowest proof. That's the bonus. So, okay. Other questions? Yeah, hi. So um, it's really interesting. I, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, thanks for the talk. And, um, Thanks for this uh, explanation. I am still getting into like learning about Bobtail. I think it can be combined with weak blocks. What I'm wondering about, and maybe you can like uh, talk about this, is um, if you don't receive the transactions uh, for one of the headers, what do you do then? And also, like in general, how do you combine the transactions for the different proofs that you generate? Okay, so. Strictly speaking, you don't need to know the transactions of the proofs that you're joining together. You just need to know the Merkle root. You just need to know the, the proof header, right? So what happens is every miner grabs together the transactions that they want to mine, and then they make a header out of that, and then they hash it. I'm, I'm missing some details here, but uh, they hash it, and then if it's below um, k times the target, then it's a valid proof. I'm not explaining how I got k times target, but it's in the paper. So um, if you just have, if, so let's say you do this and you, you're a miner and you come up with a proof that's below k times the target, you would send just the header out over the network. Now I do that and I've got a collection of proofs and I, I gather all the ones I need and I take all 40 and that is the new, the new block and I just need to know the transactions that I know about. So that's the basic Bobtail scheme. But this is compatible with the other talks where people talked about weak blocks and knowing what the other miners are doing and that, so that's a, that's a sort of, just to show that this is synergistic with other ideas. But strictly speaking, it's a standalone idea as well. Okay. All right, we have uh, time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for the, can you hear me? Yep. Thanks for this graphene bobtail, amazing. Uh, so, so how does this interact with, uh, maybe compare with the ghost protocol or like proposals to cut the block target block time and the block reward in half. Um, seems like this has advantages. So ghost, um, you mean like Ethereum's ghost or a Zoar's ghost? Um, so we don't, we, if you did Bobtail, it doesn't, it doesn't change the orphan rate of Bitcoin cash or Bitcoin period. I mean, it, it, it would be, you don't need ghost basically. It doesn't, doesn't cause any problems that cause you to require ghost to come to the rescue. Um, you could, so your other question is, what if you uh, cut the block, the interblock target down from say 10 minutes to, what, you could have four blocks every 10 minutes, and so you would just use Bobtail, and um, you would really have four blocks every, you would really have a block every you know, 2.5 minutes on average with, with a much smaller variant. So it's, it's completely compatible with that. Um, yeah, so no problems there. All right, thank you very much, Brian. Thanks. <laughs>